All right, before we get started, I just want to say that this is not a clickbait. I'm not doing this for fun or attention. I don't need no judgment either. I'm not looking for any pettiness. Just sit back and enjoy the video. Since I can't personally vote because I'm not a citizen, make sure you go out there and vote for me, guys. Vote, vote, vote. What's going on, guys? First, I want to start off by saying thank you to everyone who hit me up um, after I posted the video and encouraged me to make this video. Never in my life I thought I would be sharing my story and my personal life with you guys in a platform like this. But due to the upcoming elections, I feel like it's going to be very educated for you guys to get to know a different side of one of you guys, a friend, a stranger, a follower, and how this upcoming election is going to affect me personally and my staying here in the United States of America. So let's get started. Well, first, I want to start by introducing myself. Um, my name is Elvis. Some people call me Elv. Some people call me LV. And my full name is Elvis Brian Escobar Sanai. I know. Brian is a little bit different from what you guys might know how to spell it. I guess my parents just didn't know how to spell it back in the day and just wrote it as how do you pronounce it. My hometown is Riobamba, Ecuador. For those who don't know, Ecuador is in South America. And Riobamba is just a small town down south from the capital, Quito. Both of my parents are from there. Most of my family is from Ecuador as well. And we all used to live in the same town. So let's start with the first question. So what was my life like growing up in Ecuador? Well, both of my parents got married at a very young age when they were 22. They had me at 23. I remember us living in a house. We had our own home. Uh, my parents had a business back home. Uh, they had a clothing store. But you know, back then in the early 90s in Ecuador, the economy was horrible and the job opportunities were very low as well. Like my mom was a teacher and my dad was in school to study mechanical engineering. And you know, he dropped out of school because he didn't see any any opportunities for him there so um, he took the hard choice to emigrate to this country just to give us a better life um, I was four years old so I don't remember much growing up with him I remember you know having a dad him being there him taking care of us but you know I was I was too young all I remember is my mom and I moving in with my grandma and you know just him not being around and you know every so often i would get calls i would get a letter i would get toys from him but like any kid would i would always ask like where's my dad where's my dad and you know essentially i came to understand that he was just away and you know essentially one day he will come back um two years later on 97 when i was six um, my mom made the decision also to immigrate to this country i think it was more hard for her to leave me behind than my dad because you know I didn't have anyone anybody else you know she was leaving her kid behind with her mom and sisters and and lost to take care of me because you know like my my dad was here also struggling with work you know my dad came from uh, being in school to study to study to be a mechanical engineering to one of his first jobs here being a dishwasher um so my mom decided to come here and help him out um i don't know if you guys know this but um immigrant parents or any sort of like person that immigrates to this country you know it's not cheap uh, once you get here you actually need to work to pay off that debt of you know thousands of dollars that you paid off for somebody to bring you to this country but back to the story so i remember then growing up with my grandma um, both of my grandparents from my mom and dad's side and uncles and aunts and cousins and I never really like missed anything you know I've always had toys clothes I, I, I used to go to a Catholic school and 
yeah like it was it was it was sacrifice that they made to give me a a, a better life whether it was there essentially you know when i also immigrated here so how did i ended up actually coming to this country and what was the reason why uh, at that point in my life they decided to or, or yeah they decided to bring me to to the united states so when i was 10 years old um some of you guys actually know this but i guess i'll be telling this story again um so when i was 10 years old i had a small accident well actually a huge accident um i was playing around in a construction site with my cousins and I fell from the second floor of a story building and cracked my head open. Uh, they rushed me to the hospital, which, funny story, my grandma was also in the same hospital where they rushed me at. And they couldn't really do much when I got there. So, from where I used to live, the hospital couldn't really like stop the bleeding or some sort of thing that was going on when I cracked my head open that they had to transfer me to the capital, Quito because you know it was a better choice and there were better chances of doing something for me back then um when i was put in the ambulance to transfer from one hospital to the other hospital i remember my aunt telling me that she had to sign a permission slip because i was very bad and anything could have happened you know during that four hour drive like if i was to flatline on the way they were not responsible for it so it was a bold choice for my at that time my family to make because my parents didn't know um they were scared to tell my parents because god forbid you know like my mom at that time was pregnant with ashley oh actually she just had given birth to ashley and you know they just didn't want to stress her stress her out but long story short i got to the hospital of quito and the doctors did their surgery uh, they were able to stop the bleeding and the, and the blood clot in my head and essentially you know after surgery I didn't wake up until like five days later so I was like within those five days I was like in a small coma you know they were just waiting for me to respond to the medicine and the surgery god forbid you know I woke up I didn't lose my memory I didn't lose my sight or speech because there were a bunch of nerves that were damaged, I guess, um, when, you know, my head got cracked open. So essentially I have like five scars in my head. Um, that's why like I've never really had a short haircut because, you know, there was show. So I've always had like a long kind of like hairstyle. So yeah, so then after that happened, I had to go through physical therapy for like a month or two and then my birthday came about uh, that's when i turned 10 and a month later you know 9 11 happened so after 9 11 happened you know um the border as you know as well as immigration and travel got very you know got very strict so my parents right away after the accident they wanted to bring me to the united states because they felt like you know um who knows what could happen and with me over there you know, was to stay since i was already like getting into like accidents and trouble so they decided to bring me here so i came to this country in the winter of 2002 uh i think it was january february when i got here so what was my life like when i arrived to the united states of america so as a kid, you know, I was already used to certain things, certain environment um, of school, of having the freedom to go to the park, of having a family, having a house. So when I came to New York, um, it was shock to me just the fact that my family lived in a building. You know, when I was in Ecuador, we had a backyard, we had a garage, we had a house to ourselves having to go from there to live in a city where you live in an apartment with a bunch of other people and a building with so many apartments in the city where you have to take the train everywhere. It was very different, you know? Um, when I was little, I actually had an idea of what New York was like, but never really thought it was going to be like Harlem, like the hood, basically. So 
I saw some crazy things growing up here, you know, in the in, in, in the early 2000s. Harlem was not the best place in the world to live in. Um, nevertheless, to say it was, you know, really, really bad. But, you know, I used to see drug dealers. I used to see people getting shot and fights in the street that I was never really used to any of that stuff. So to me, I was basically coming from a very innocent childhood where nothing was really, you know, bad where I, where I lived to here to see just many crazy things going on. Um, I had taken a test and got into a public school nearby my house. Um, I remember just being shocked by the diversity of kids in my school. You know from asian to black to hispanic like caribbean and stuff like that that was very new to me coming from you know living in south america where there's a lot of diversity in ecuador too we have you know people of color and trienos and people that look like me um so it was just different um for the first three school years of my life here i was in a bilingual class um english obviously is my second language so it took me a while to get adjusted to the language i remember being in school and just not knowing what the hell was going on especially since i was submitted in the middle of a school year you know um when it came time to take tests regions having to have like different sort of like translation papers it was it was just very it was like an extra step that I needed to take, but nevertheless, you know, I made it. I I found a way to learn the language very fast. If I look at it now, you know, I laugh about it. But I remember there were times in high school where you know kids were being mean because my accent was thick, because I couldn't pronounce any words. I remember I used to hate it where when a teacher used to call you to read aloud because you know i knew that in any kind of in any sort of sentence i was going to miss a word and somebody one smart ass is going to make fun of me um i remember a specific moment where we was in science class and our um a science teacher was explaining something with chemicals and i had repeated a word that i learned from the textbook and everybody made fun of me because i wasn't pronouncing it right so you know i, I didn't understand what kids were mean and even my own friends you know they found it funny, but to me it was just not amused as they thought. But I never really, I never really used to get it to me. You know, it was just I always used to just brush it off. But you know, it's something to think about when you when you have friends like that. You know, it's it's not funny to make um, jokes about somebody's accent because hey, like they trying, they didn't have the same opportunity that as you that you know English was your first language. So, you know, that's something that I think humbled me in my work environment, in my life. Like, I never really, like, try to put anybody down. Everybody that knows me knows that, you know, in the food and beverage industry where, you know, I work, there's a lot of immigrants. And when I see them, it's like I see my parents. It's like I see myself. So being the guy that I am now in the position that I'm in, you know, being a manager, being some sort of like authority, a supervisor, I I help them out. I care for them. I listen to their needs. You know, that's why sometimes I also used to struggle managing people because I would put my title to a side and actually be a person and help them out instead of just reprimanding them or firing them. So that's also that's also one of my biggest weakness when it comes to you know having a job that I'm always a nice guy. It's, it's hard for me to actually put a foot down and actually like fire somebody on the spot or implement somebody because I, I always find a way that you know you need to talk to people find find out you know what's lacking in their in their life because you just never know what people go through um but it wasn't until high school where i noticed that my immigration status actually matter and made me very different from everyone else um, from the rest of my friends um, just from you know sophomore junior year where people already start talking to you about college you know and not having papers kind of puts you in the pedestal that you know 
you don't have that many options. So uh, all my friends were looking into going away for school and all this great colleges. I kind of got bumped into not knowing where I would be after high school. You know, like all my choices were just very limited to like community college, a random ass college. Like I, I didn't have the opportunity to, to actually look forward into anything. But that didn't stop me from, you know, taking my SATs, getting good grades or any sort of. Um, I just never, never really told anyone. None of my friends knew that I couldn't go to where they were going. Um, I was used to just dash that bullet and to like just change the subject of conversation. I remember senior year, you know, most of my friends were getting the license. Um, I remember our, our crew, some of us started getting cards. And, you know, I remember feeling bad at that time as well that I couldn't get a driver's license. I couldn't get any sort of like ID to get a car. And, you know, it just came to my attention that, you know, essentially what was what was my life going to be like after I graduate school? And even if I go to school, college, what am I going to do if I can't get a job? So a lot of people didn't know this side of me and I kept it like, you know, to myself. So yeah, so after high school, I ended up just going to a community college. I had to pay it off pocket. I, I actually got a job as a waiter because I couldn't get any other job. You know, I didn't have, I didn't have papers. So being a waiter was the only option that I had, you know. Um, but luckily, you know, in 2012, um, the DACA program came about. So for you guys who don't know what DACA is, deferral action for childhood arrivals so now let's get into the technicalities of what daca is so in order to join this program you had to have a clean record you had to had arrived to the united states uh before 16 years old you had to have finished a high school uh, diploma or degree um and you had to have a clean record um, so all of those things matter during the application time. So luckily for me, I was able to get into the program. So what that program offers to you, it offers you with a valid green card to work and a social. So after working for this company, I was offered an opportunity to become a manager because I, you know, like I said before, like I was a people person. So I kind of like grew within the industry that I was working in. Um, as a waiter so essentially I became a manager and when the opportunity came to me to sign the offer letter I was scared because I was scared for them to ask me for my real papers and lucky for me in 2012 this act happened and I applied right away and within months I was able to get a green car and a social so for me like I'm very thankful for this DACA program because it changed my life completely I was able to get a driver's license. I was able to find a job. I was able to move up in the industry. I was no longer limited to choices like before. So what I want you guys to get out of this video is also understand that people like me depend on this DACA program. Every two years, we have to reapply to state in this country and to be able to work as well. So every two years, you have to go through the same applications. You have to submit a clean record. You have to submit uh, taxes. You have to have uh, all your statuses up to date and you have to pay a fee of $800. Every two years, I go through the same trouble of doing this, doing this application, waiting for my new green car. So what some of you guys don't know is that Trump is actually trying to get rid of this program as of right now he's trying to get rid of the limit of two years to one year so for me can you guys imagine every single year i have to reapply to stay here to be able to work here to be able to pay taxes here to be able to just keep my green car so that's a hundred dollars every year i can't get into any trouble that's why i've never been the kind of guy to drive crazy get drunk you know like i get issues with the police because i can't afford to do it if god forbid there's a day where you know something happens to me with the authorities i can get deported 
you guys will not see me here anymore. And a lot of my friends didn't know that about me. So it's kind of, you know, trapped in the box where you have to maintain a certain image, a certain lifestyle, not to get in trouble, just to be able to work here. So Trump is trying to get rid of that program. And that's why it's so important for you guys to go vote because Biden under Obama is trying to actually extend the option for us DACA recipients to get residency in the United States. So that day when I put out the video of encouraging my friends to go vote is very important. I actually never really wanted to put that video out there. Like I've always tried to stay away from any um, politics because then you know I get too emotional to get into it with friends but at the end of the day now more than ever you know I feel like you guys can make a difference and this is one of the things that actually matters to people like me uh, what I want you guys to get out of this is that support Biden obviously he's not a perfect guy there's obviously many other wrong things that people find with his policies and um you know decisions but hopefully you know that can change but right now with trump still being in power my chances of staying here are very little and i don't want to go anywhere i don't want to live this country i don't want to leave my friends i I'm used to this lifestyle and my family is here. So, yeah, guys, that's my life story. Hopefully, you guys have a better understanding of me now. Um, and I'm pretty sure there's more people out there like me, obviously. So, now I'm just going to answer a few questions that some of you guys have asked me on Instagram. And, yeah. This is from Lewis. Lewis is actually an old employee of mine. Him and I used to work together in my previous job. He asks, um, the whole system, how does it work? A lot of people think that is an easy process. So as I explained earlier, it is not an easy process. Every two years, we have to reapply for this, um, this petition, basically, for a new green car. And then we have to go to the DMV, get a new ID, we have to um, get the money order. Uh, so there's a lot of variables within that you have to do. You have to get a clean record. You have to do a fingerprints. You have to lose a day of work to go and get your fingerprints done. So it's not an easy process to do. It takes a lot of time. It costs a lot of money. And a lot of people didn't know that. Uh, next question is from Bianca. It says, what actual, what actual policies or laws or either both or none of the candidates are doing for DACA? So as I explained earlier, Trump is trying to get rid of the DACA program. And with that, that leaves a big question mark about dreamers and what's going to happen to us. He might not have a plan for us. So it's very important for you guys to vote. And let's try to get him out because it's not just about the economy or the business size that he's doing is a lot of other bad things that is going to affect us people like me if he stays in power this goes from lewis he's actually a relative of mine um, in ecuador he says que extrañas de ecuador um so i'm gonna actually answer that in spanish for you guys que te digo extraño obviamente a mi familia uh, si ustedes no saben, yo no he podido ver a mi familia en ya casi 18 años de estar aquí. Entonces obviamente extraño a mis abuelitos, a mis primos, a mi ciudad, um, everything, you know. I, I miss every single little thing about my country. I, 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 I hope I can travel there soon, one day. Before we get to the next question, I actually wanted to bring this up. Um, so when I put the video on Instagram that I was doing this video, um, uh, I guess we friends, right? A friend of mine, well, uh, <laughs> I guess I can call you a friend now. But a girl that I actually used to talk to hit me up. Um, she has a beautiful family now 
um, she just recently gave birth to a baby girl so congrats but um I didn't know this about her and when she wrote back to me um, it was actually a surprise and I kind of want to show the message um, hopefully you know she agrees for me to post this but it says uh, just want to tell you that I admire your bravery and I'm glad that you will make a video about about it I am a DACA recipient too which I didn't know and that is so crazy literally relate to the fact that no one really knows but just because i've always felt like it's super personal and not that many people understand you or can relate to your struggles nice to know that i'm not the only person i won't say the girl's name but her i obviously replied to her and it's crazy because um we both didn't know that about each other and i was telling her i was like wow like that that could have been a first uh, when we went on our first date, uh, easy icebreaker. But is that you just never know, and it's not like this a stranger thing that you can find out of somebody. It's just something that you just don't know. You know what I'm saying? And not everybody can relate, and everybody cannot understand the struggle that you're living behind closed doors. So I'm glad that she wrote to me. Like I said again, wish you the best to you and your beautiful family. And yeah guys, you just never know who you never you just never know who has struggles and who doesn't. Um next question. This is from Maria Brito. I know I cannot be the only one who's like, what is DACA recipient? So definitely talk about that. So I definitely spoke about it earlier. So I want you guys to also, you know, find more information about what is that uh, what is being a DACA recipient. So you know it's, it's it's a very touchy subject for you guys to understand because some of you guys were probably born here but for some of us you know it's, it's a hassle to maintain our statuses our records our driver's license so you know understand that some of us have to be more careful than others and we can't risk it we can't risk for that program to go away because who knows you might not see me anymore but I want to stay. So. Wow, I can't believe I really went through it making this video. Um, but thanks for watching, guys. I can honestly say that this was one of the hardest things that I ever had to do. I was so nervous. I was losing words to express how I was feeling. Um, there were things that I had to cut out that it was just a little too emotional for me to put out, but I feel like I I got through, you know, sending my my story to you guys and my perspective. You know, one of the things that I want you guys to get out of this is, you know, to be more open-minded with one another, be more kind to your coworkers, to your friends, to even a stranger, because you just never know what they're going through. Um, everyone has a past. We all working to be a better person every day. So, you know, most of my friends didn't know that about me. And, you know, I'm glad that they understand now or they share some sort of like sympathy or, you know, understanding. We just gotta be better people day by day. But nevertheless, today is Monday. Part one just went up. Part two is gonna go up tonight at 8 p.m um there's still time to vote guys so please get out there tomorrow is the day let's make sure that we make our voices be heard make your voice be heard for me as your friend as your follower as a stranger that you just might know for certain years a certain time and yeah please leave a comment if you have any questions share this video if you want to and I'll see you guys tonight at 8 p.m. for part two. Thanks for watching, guys. Peace out.